Hello everyone. Today uh, we begin with the planning part of vision planning and control in aerial robotics. Uh, we will be discussing today among other topics what is a plan uh, and how do we get from point A to point B or how do we uh, you know in a humanoid robot how do we put down a foot or let's say if there's a rover on Mars how do we navigate the terrain and go from point A to point B uh, the topics that will be covered as part of the planning part of the whole uh, course is basically the necessity of planning uh, and what kind of challenges are encountered in planning uh, we will also be discussing motion planning which is the concepts that are required to plan any sort of motion they need not be path planning specifically but any sort of motion under that we will be discussing what is geometric modeling half space representations of objects configuration spaces and the concept of uh, obstacle and free uh, in the sea space we will also be discussing in further lectures uh, planning in discrete spaces including things like graph search, uh, depth first, breadth first search, Dijkstra's algorithm, A star, etc. We will also be discussing planning in continuous spaces where we uh, talk about probabilit probabilistic roadmaps, uh, <coughs> rapidly exploring random trees, etc. Today we will be covering the first two uh, headings that we discuss, which is the introduction and motion planning concepts. Uh, here is the bibliography for the course. Uh, we will be taking a lot of um, data and uh, topics from the planning algorithms textbook of Stephen Laval. Uh, it's an excellent book and it has been uh, graciously provided to us on the website mentioned as a downloadable PDF as the whole book or in chapters. Also probabilistic robots by Sebastian Thrun et al is also a really good book. So beginning with this uh, planning for robotics, right? Uh, the first question that we must ask is wherever you may be watching this lecture, the, the question is how did you get there, right? You weren't always in that place, right? You were in some location previous to that and you decided to go to that place, right? In, in our case, let's say that you decided to come to the lecture hall. So what you first did was you knew where you are, let's call that location A, you uh, knew where you have to go, which is let's say location B. And then you, in your mind, uh, without actually having first moved, you first decided how do we get from A to B, right? So that is the planning part of things. And obviously you expected or you knew that there would be some obstacles along the way. Let's say there are cars passing, there are other people, there are bicyclists, there are animals on the road. There can be any number of obstacles and you uh, avoided them with some degree of success and you reached uh, the location B from A. So let's say you went from A to B with some obstacle. And obviously, uh, for people who are new to the campus, let's say, you might have used a map which tells you which path to take, which path not to take, etc. Uh, so planning can then be called a selection of a certain sequence of actions, right, to meet a certain goal, which means that, let's say, you have to get from A to B, you might have to go via C right so you cannot directly go from A to B you have to first select C you have to go to C and then you will be able to go to B right so that's what I mean by a certain sequence of actions to meet a certain goal so your goal was to go from A to B and you picked a certain set of actions to do so uh, there are uh, the example that we have been talking about like getting from point A to point B has only uh, been talking about path planning but obviously planning really like is involved in a lot of other tasks as well anything any any task that you might require a robot to do has to be planned first otherwise you might uh, end up taking certain actions which might cause your robot to blow up let's say uh, 
or fall into a pit or something like that. Uh, the sequence of actions that we were talking about must have certain characteristics, right? One of them is that it must be hierarchical, which means that uh, it must follow a certain uh, set of levels, right? So first you have the high level plan, which is that, okay, I must get from A to B. That's your overall goal, right? Along that, uh, you, you have let's say that to go from A to B, I first have to go from A to C. So let's say that this is a sub goal and then you have to go from C to B, which is another sub goal. So that's a second level, a second level in your hierarchy of plans. And then between A to C, let's say, you have to take care of uh, things like avoiding obstacles, which is also a set of plan, right? Uh, things like that. So it must be hierarchical. Uh, also, it must ensure that uh, contingency is taken into account, which means that let's say that suddenly there is a huge elephant here, right? You cannot take this path anymore, which means that you might have to have planned previously some other path D, right? Which takes into account the fact that if you cannot go to B via C, you have a backup option. That is what we mean by contingency. Also, uh, we must ensure that let's say that uh, uh, D uh, is our one of our sub goals and you have to go from A to B, it might be, it might seem easier. Let's say that the path from A to B is shorter, but there are potholes, right? So uh, there is a cost to traversing those potholes. So the cost versus the reward. In this case, the reward is getting from A to B in, let's say, the shortest amount of time, right? So the cost versus the reward trade-off must be done optimally. So even though, let's say, A to B via C is a longer path if it is free of potholes it makes more sense because then your robot has less chances of crashing or whatever so this cost reward trade-off is something we will be dealing with continuously in uh, all sorts of planning problems so as we were talking about previously uh, planning can uh, and ideally should be done for several applications which include but are obviously not limited to things like task planning which means that okay i have to go to let's say grocery shopping there are a certain set of tasks that i must fulfill like let's say get the milk get the eggs get the bread and uh, i must plan a certain uh, set of actions for doing each of them right in the most optimal manner uh, we have obviously as we were discussing path planning which is how do we create and plan a path that takes you from start to end right we also have trajectory planning which is something we will be dealing with uh, as far as drones are concerned which is that just because you have let's say a to b let's say that you have a path uh, something like this doesn't mean that your drone will be able to exactly follow this path right it cannot take sharp turns so what what you will be ending up doing is uh, creating a trajectory right which is uh, a path which your drone or your robot can ideally follow right uh, you have uh, things like foot placement planning which is uh, in case of humanoid robots how exactly must uh, the robot uh, place its foot at what velocity at what angle must the robot place its foot such that uh, your uh, robot doesn't tip over and fall and it is able to successfully walk you have things like grasp planning as uh, shown here which is that uh, given an object and a robot end effector uh, how must uh, the robot approach the object uh, how must uh, the robot uh, uh, you know grasp uh, put its fingers around the object how much force to apply everything all of that comes under grasp planning so these are just a few of the various types of planning uh, that is available uh, which uh, become more and more clear as you uh, proceed but the basic concepts of pretty much all planning remains the same uh, proceeding with uh, the challenges in planning for robotics because uh, it's not an easy task right to create and execute a robot plan uh, there are several things that need to be taken into account. One of them is execution time, right? You cannot take forever to go from point A to point B or to put down your foot um, or to grasp an object. Uh, you need to do it within a finite and 
reasonable amount of time uh, also uh, in case of a trajectory or a path you must be able to optimize the length right uh, which means that you must have the shortest time and uh, the shortest uh, length of the path given a collision free path which means that as we were talking earlier even though um, there are obstacles in the way uh, the you must uh, be able to navigate around that path even if it means taking a slightly longer route uh, in case of uh, things like uh, robot manipulators you have something that becomes uh, that that we call search space complexity right which means that if we must be able to search uh, through a given uh, system about which places which particular positions of this manipulator are valid and which are not so let's say that you have a set like a seven degree of freedom uh, robot hand uh, you are dealing with a very high dimensional uh, robot and uh, for you to be able to plan a path becomes very complex so that's one of the challenges when you're planning uh, for high dimensional uh, robots a terrain interaction becomes a thing like as we were talking about the mars rover for example has to deal with very complex terrain uh, including uh, things like uh, you know uh, high ground low ground uh, hot uh, you know where the sun has a high amount of exposure things like that so terrain interaction becomes another huge factor when you're planning uh, for robotics uh, dynamic obstacles, unpredictable environment, uh, these are obvious, uh, especially in this age of self-driving cars and, you know, drones, where uh, things can happen uh, at any time and you must uh, be able to avoid them and uh, yet be able to complete your task. In case of drones uh, and in case of uh, fast moving vehicles, uh, robot dynamics becomes uh, a very important thing uh, because you must be able to handle uh, fast moving robots and still be able to have complete maneuverability of your robot. So uh, that in that that completes the first uh, two topics which is like uh, which we discuss is like why uh, do we need planning and uh, what are the challenges in uh, planning moving on uh, we come to the uh, first topic of motion planning which is geometric modeling right so the question uh, becomes why do we need geometric modeling so uh, our main task is to produce a motion plan uh, of the robot where it goes from the certain uh, start state to so let's call this start state to the goal without having collision obviously we don't want uh, collision so what we must do in that case is to be able to identify uh, certain locations and uh, certain points in our world uh, which is this whole green thing this part right here uh, where uh, the robot can safely move without having the aforementioned uh, collision so uh, we this this brings us to something called the piano movers problem which is that let's assume that you have a piano uh, represented by this yellow box here and you must get it within your house to uh, the goal right so you so so without having collisions obviously so what you need to be able to do is to if you see this diagram here you should be able to successfully move and rotate uh, so translation in case of this and rotation here uh, you must be able to successfully uh, rotate and uh, translate your piano such that it can go from point A to point B without having a collision obviously so the idea is that you require an accurate model of the robot and the obstacles so in this case you need an accurate model of your piano and you need an accurate model of your obstacles the green uh, dashes and the green uh, convex points uh, you require that to create your plan so even before you have actually physically moved your piano you first need to plan how you will be moving the piano so geometric modeling basically allows you to do this representation so let us assume that we have a robot a in a certain configuration Q within our workspace right so we also have 
O obstacles within our workspace and the workspace is either a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional space. Uh, the geometric representations okay, of both the robot as well as the obstacles must be computationally efficient yet have no loss in detail which means that we don't want to be dealing with real high definition 3d models of obstacles i i i can see why that would that would be a uh, interesting solution or uh, something that we may want because you get the maximum amount of detail but uh, the computation that will uh, be required to manipulate these high dimen high high definition 3d objects will be extremely high which means that your plan as we mentioned must have a certain execution time right so if you're dealing with a very high uh, detailed uh, representation you will be definitely uh, unable to uh, perform efficient computationally efficient uh, planning but at the same time if you reduce the uh, detail you uh, increase the computational efficiency definitely but at the same time a loss in detail can mean that you are not accurately representing uh, the complete uh, information so you can say that if your robot looks like this you can uh, let's say represent it in a simpler form as a square right but so it's it's always easier to deal with a square right but at the same time you are missing out on all of these extra bits and pieces right so there is again like we come again to the trade-off that we must have a trade-off between computational efficiency and uh, detail of representation uh, so one of the ways to uh, represent this is using something we call half space representation so what is uh, half space representation so let's say that uh, we have some polygon right which looks like this so this is a one two three four five six right this is a hexagon uh, we can say that if we want to represent this obstacle we can uh, call it uh, we can represent it as a set of boolean combinations which means either uh, intersections or unions of several half spaces right so what is a half space so let's say that we have some space and we draw a line right we draw a line through that space so anything let's say to the left of the space is one half of that space and anything to the right is the other half of that space now uh, we can start to f draw more and more lines right so since this is an intersection you can see that if I, uh, sorry, so you can see that if I draw a line here, because this is an intersection, this middle part goes away, right? So you're basically starting to uh, remove more and more space. So uh, this is the second line. Again, we have to the right of and to the left of the line. And then we continue uh, along uh, like this creating more and more intersections, creating more and more intersections until uh, what we have is basically a set of line equations, a set of half space representation, as you can call it, to form our given final figure, right, which is what we originally needed here. So uh, to give a more formal uh, mathematical uh, background, uh, a solid representation of a convex polygon O, which is this guy right here, as a combination of half plane primitives. So this is a primitive, which means that this is the smallest uh, definition, uh, the, the smallest uh, representation by which you can define a half space. So the formula goes that each half space I uh, consists of a set of X and Y belonging to the workspace W such that uh, the f of i of x comma y is less than or equal to zero right what that means is that let's say my f of i is x comma y is defined as ax plus by plus c equal to zero which is basically you can think of it as a line equation so this part anything to the right of is f of x greater than zero 
and anything to the left of is f of x less than 0, right? So that that is represented by this plus and this minus. So by a combination of half spaces, we can finally form complex convex polygons. Uh, we now introduce the very important concept of configuration spaces, which is that uh, we first define what is a configuration. A configuration is a complete specification of the position of every point in the system. So uh, the set of all of these configurations is basically what we call the C space or the configuration space, right? So what happens then is that in our configuration space, a motion planning problem is now reduced to going from QI to QG, which is the initial to the goal, while avoiding these C obstacles staying within the C free, right? So you have two main things, right? So this whole blob right here is C. Uh, this white space in between is our so-called allowed free path. And the intersection of that with whatever my obstacles are is basically my complete world. So uh, one of the things we must know about configuration spaces is that for, let's say, a robot with k degrees of freedom, the configuration space is essentially a new coordinate system with one dimension per degree of freedom, which means that for a seven degree of freedom Baxter arm, let's say, its configuration space is basically a coordinate system with seven dimensions, right? So for every degree of freedom, you have one dimension in the configuration space. In uh, the configuration space, a robot pose, which is basically the location and the orientation, is simplified into a point, which means that you uh, convert your robot into a point object and the obstacle now becomes one of those complex, uh, one of those convex polygons that we were discussing, which means that we reduce the size of the robot into a point and we compensate by increasing the width of our obstacles, something like this. So the idea is that we transform our path planning problem from a Cartesian space, which is this right here, into a configuration space we solve our planning problem much simply here because our robot is now a point object it's far easier to deal with point objects than to deal with multiple convex polygons right so we convert our problem into a configuration space we solve our planning problem in configuration space and then we convert it back into our cartesian So let us take the case of uh, how to convert from a Cartesian workspace to a configuration space. So let's say that this is our robot right here. We pick a point here, right? Let's say that this is the point on the robot that I have chosen, right? I take that point and I place it along the edge of my obstacle, which is this guy right here. This guy right here. I place it on the edge and then I slide it, I slide the robot, I reach here, right? If you will uh, notice that this is a robot only translating, right? Which means that uh, since this is only translating, I am not changing the way the robot is oriented, right? But always one point is in contact with my object. One point of my robot is in contact with the object. So then what I do is once I have all of these uh, five points or six points, what I do is I join them, which ends up giving me uh, the orange object. So you can see that I am already treating my robot as a point object and I have basically expanded my uh, obstacle. So you can see that this used to be my original obstacle, but I have essentially managed to make it bigger while treating the robot as a point object. Uh, taking a similar case of a robot translating and rotating in a 2D workspace. So let's say that here my robot was defined by some position x comma y. Uh, here my robot will now be uh, defined by x comma y comma theta because now it is at some theta angle to the plane. 
uh, I do basically the same thing again if you will look I have fixed my point here so I fix this I fix this I fix this so on and so forth right and then uh, what what uh, I end up getting is uh, basically the complete uh, robot here and then I join these points I join these points and I get my point robot here and uh, I get my configuration space obstacle now uh, if you remember uh, this obstacle is for one configuration right so which means that as I change my theta my obstacle also changes uh, coming to uh, one of the more important concepts that we will be using is uh, the Minkowski sum and difference right uh, so the Minkowski sum of two sets uh, A and B could be anything right so let's say two we have two sets A and B uh, it is denoted by the this symbol this is the Minkowski sum symbol right so the Minkowski sum of A and B sets which consists of small a and small b which means that my set a has a1 a2 a3 a n right and my b similarly has b1 b2 still b n right so uh, it's basically the sum of the individual items in each set so the minkowski sum is given by a plus b where a belongs to a and b belongs to capital b the same goes for the minkowski difference where uh, we have this symbol representing the minkowski difference and we follow the same thing where each individual item of the set is subtracted taking that one step further uh, we come to the minkowski sum of convex polygons which is uh, that if we have two convex polygons remember convex is the important operative word here if we have two sets of convex polygons with p and q right let's say that we have two polygons p and q and each of them has m and n vertices respectively so p has m vertices and q has n vertices uh, the minkowski sum of these two polygons is again as we mentioned given by p circle plus q which has m plus n vertices respectively which means that if p had m vertices q had n vertices the polygon that is given by the minkowski sum of these two has m plus n vertices uh, we just mentioned uh, convexity is an important thing when we are discussing uh, minkowski polygons a uh, minkowski sum and difference so what is convexity uh, let's say that again we have a set s it is called uh, convex if and only if every line segment connecting the two points in S is contained within S which means that let's say that my set S is a convex polygon right which I'm representing using vertices right so let's say that this is set S and each of these are elements in set S right so these two points lie within the set S right these two points let's say again lie within set s etc etc so if you take any two points in this uh, convex in this set uh, you will find that every point on these two points right or connecting this line segment will be within this s which means that this set is convex here uh, if you take uh, this example you can clearly see that this part of the line segment is obviously outside the set right it's obviously outside the set so we cannot call this convex similarly here it might seem that you know this line segment is within this line segment is within but if we take let's say these two points again it's not convex so every point on each of these convex polygons in each of these sets must be within the overall set obviously this itself is non-convex this combination is obviously non-convex so this whole set is non-convex uh, we now further discuss uh, how do we represent obstacles 
in our workspace, which is our Cartesian coordinates in C space, right? So now that we know what is a Minkowski sum and Minkowski difference, we can uh, and and what is a convex set, we can proceed uh, further into discussing uh, obstacles from workspace to C space. So let's say that P is some obstacle, right, which is represented here. So let's say P is some obstacle in a workspace, and M is a moving object, which is let's say a robot, right? Then the C space obstacle, which means that we have an obstacle in workspace and we are converting that to obstacle in C space, right? So is this obstacle in C space is given by the uh, corresponding Minkowski difference of P and M, which means that the P is our obstacle and M is our robot and this is what gives us our final obstacle in the C space. So the formula for that is QOI, which means that Q being the 2D configuration space, which means the obstacle in the 2D configuration space is given by, uh, for every configuration, right? For every configuration small Q in our capital Q. So as I mentioned before, that if your robot is represented by let's say X comma Y comma theta, changing theta will change your obstacle right so similarly changing x and y will also uh, change your obstacle so let's say that r is a robot which means that for every configuration small q the robot being in that configuration intersection the workspace obstacle not being equal to null set right so that's the formula uh, what this means is that this whole sliding operation that we have been doing right this whole taking the robot and sliding it around that is mathematically speaking the minkowski difference of the obstacle with the robot we come to an important uh, algorithm that uh, will help you to generate these uh, obstacles that will generally help you to generate uh, the C space obstacles. So we come, we discuss the star algorithm, which basically is an algorithm that determines how this uh, sliding operation that we have been talking about will work, right? So the star algorithm determines the sliding contact of the robot around the obstacle and the order of the sliding operation. So you cannot just take your robot and just put it wherever you want because that's obviously going to give you incorrect results right so there is a particular way to do this so the star algorithm helps you with that so the first and most important rule is that we choose one direction right counterclockwise or clockwise and we stick to that so either we go this way or we go this way but never both together right uh, we have a certain convention which is that when we uh, use uh, the normals we say that the robot normal always points inwards and the obstacle normal always points outwards, which means that you can see here that this is pointing outwards, whereas in this case, it's pointing inwards. We pick, let's say that now we take this circular, uh, because we are going in a counterclockwise direction, which is what we have chosen, we pick our start angle. So let's say that this is a reference point. We pick some start angle, right? let's not call it theta but some start angle and uh, we proceed in that direction what that means is that we have a set of vectors right so one two three four five six seven right so we have a set of vectors so based on the start angle we take the next largest vector so in this case the next largest vector happens to be r2 right we put that here so we have basically taken this and displaced it here right we do the same for the next largest which is e1 after e1 we can see that there is nothing in between uh, in the robot so we proceed and we get e4 so on and so forth until we uh, complete our 360 circle right so uh, what this gives us is this final diagram what this gives us is this uh, final uh, diagram sorry which gives us the order in which we must uh, compute our sliding motion right so what we have then is uh, basically the number of vectors gives us the total number of uh, sides that our completed polygon will have 
uh, we have we have successfully uh, managed to construct all of the obstacles in our configuration space which means that we have converted all the obstacles from our workspace to our configuration space but we have no representation or we haven't discussed any representation so far about uh, what the free space representation will be so as you remember uh, our total uh, configuration space is basically c free plus c obstacle right we have discussed this we have managed to get this done but we haven't managed to get this right so one thing that we must remember is that uh, the c space which is basically the new coordinate system that we are discussing uh, the dimensionality increases very fast which means that for a seven degree of freedom we have a seven dimension uh, configuration space so the more you add articulation, which means that the more uh, joints that you have in your robot, for example, uh, it, it, it racks up the total number of dimensions of our configuration space. So we cannot obviously, you know, have some way of defining every possible point like how we did previously. We cannot have a, a way of, uh, you know, defining every single point in our C free, right? So uh, what is the solution, right? So turns out that we have two possible approaches, right? One is to approximate or one is to randomize, which means that we either approximate the free space or we do some sort of a probabilistic random model to uh, negotiate uh, our free space. Uh, approximation is basically we take the free space, uh, which is basically the total space without the obstacles and we divide it up, right? Uh, we have this to be our whole thing. We have this to be, let's say, an obstacle. Whatever we have remaining, we break it up into smaller and smaller grids, right? We can we can do that. Uh, and then we have simplified our problem because uh, now we can do things like grid search. We can do all sorts of regular planning algorithms and we can use that to go from our start to goal. Uh, Another, uh, so so how does this reduce our complexity? So one of the things is that we don't have to deal with every point in our, C's, in our, in our free space. We can just deal with complete grid objects, right? So that simplifies our problem uh, by uh, reducing our computation, right? So we can take only the whole grids and we can move according to that. The other way to do it is to uh, let's say that we have again a similar diagram. Let's say that this is our obstacle. Uh, we can randomize the robot in the free space, right? Which means that let's say that we have a robot. We know that this is our start. We can take the robot and we can put it at some random point R, right? And we can check, is the robot uh, allowed to be in that state? In this case, yes. Let's say that we pick a random point and it lies here, right? So we know that this is in the obstacle, so we cannot select this point so on and so forth so uh, we randomize right and then we, it turns out that if we randomize this long enough we reach the goal right so going from i to goal was our original plan so again uh, trade-off the trade-off becomes uh, between performance and completeness which means that if let's say we make the grid really big right we can quickly go from start to end right we can quickly go from here to here but at the sake of uh, at the sake of completeness which means that we may not find the shortest path let's say this may not be the shortest path let's say that there is another path and if our grid was smaller we might have discovered that shorter path better but obviously that's going to increase the time so performance so performance versus completeness it's a battle uh, same goes for uh, randomness right again if we pick fewer random points maybe we might find a path that goes like this but that is obviously not the shortest path right the shortest path is something like this let's say so we are not guaranteed completeness we are not even guaranteed that you know our random uh, points that we select will ever reach the goal we are not guaranteed that so it we are not guaranteed completeness but the performance is very high so again the trade-off becomes clear once we start to discuss these sort of approximations or randomizations. Uh, there are uh, two, uh, let's, let's discuss two very broad methods. One of them, as we were discussing, is cell decomposition, right? So let's say that this whole thing is our obstacle. What we do is we divide our whole thing into a grid, as you can see here, and we only take complete cells. So this is one cell, this is one cell, this is one cell, and this is one cell, right? 
so we say that this is our actual this is our uh, computed obstacle whereas this whole thing is a real obstacle right and then we just uh, start doing a grid search right so we only pick complete cells so ideally speaking uh, we 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 could have selected this step also but as it turns out that this would have ensured a collision so one of the ways what we do is once we get near an obstacle we divide the grid further to get better uh, knowledge about our obstacles so that is called cell decomposition and uh, the other uh, possible option is to use what we were discussing is called probabilistic roadmaps which means that we start putting points right we start randomly putting points and we see that given the set of points can we traverse from start to end uh, obviously this point right here that you can see here this line is not going to be valid because it's passing through this obstacle uh, talking about uh, the trade-off between complexity and performance we know what the performance of a planning algorithm should be let's talk about completeness so Planning algorithms exist in several flavors, right? Uh, depending on the completeness of the algorithm. So what is a complete planning algorithm? It means that if a solution exists, which means that if there is an, in, in case of path planning, if there is a path to go from start to goal, the planning algorithm is guaranteed to find it. Otherwise, it reports that this path cannot be found. Uh, it might seem like a common sense uh, thing or it might seem trivial but remember that because our CFC uh, free is so large it is uh, relatively difficult to know whether or not a plan does not exist so if a plan exists it finds it that's fine but if it does not exist that becomes an important question so a complete planner does both it not only finds the obstacle uh, it not only finds the path but it also reports that the path cannot be found so these kind of uh, complete planners, basically uh, geometry based planners uh, fall under complete planning algorithms. Uh, as I was saying, the other way is the semi-complete uh, planning algorithm, which means that if the solution exists, that sure, it will find it. But if there is no solution, the failure reporting never happens, which means that let's say that the space is too large for it to compute every possible uh, outcome. It may run forever. It may never complete. but in certain cases it might you 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 might be okay with that which means that uh, you your problem statement is such that you can be assured that most of the time you will find a solution so you don't care about the smaller number of times when it might fail right so semi-complete is obviously more performance uh, worthy uh, but at the same time you have this criteria that you must take care of so as you can see that as you go down you are basically uh, you know a trading off between completeness and performance so we discuss so so another way is the resolution complete right which means that this is very uh, important uh, when you start doing grid based or interval based planners is that if the solution exists it finds it but if the solution is not available then it reports the solution not found only for that specified resolution which means that let's say I have a graph that looks like this right so there is a certain resolution so what I mean by resolution is the size of the grid so let's say that this is of X and Y uh, dimensions each of the grids right so if let's say that I cannot find a path from here to here I will be able to know that I cannot find a path but let's say that I reduce the size of the grid right the path may exist in that case but my resolution complete algorithm is will will not be unable to uh, will will be unable to tell you that that if I reduce my resolution or if I change my resolution whether or not a path exists so that's a resolution uh, complete uh, planning algorithm and uh, obviously uh, these are applicable to grid or interval based planners uh, we have a probabilistic complete planning algorithm which means uh, that in these kind of uh, algorithms if a solution exists the probability that the solution will be found tends to one as the number of search iteration tends to infinity which means that if I have a plan like this uh, 
depending on let's say the number of points that I choose to sample from my world right as I was as we were discussing in in case of probabilistic roadmaps we start putting points right in our environment and we check so depending on the number of points which means that the number of times I choose to search my workspace uh, or my configuration space as that uh, tends to infinity I have a higher probability that my goal will be found so obviously sampling based planners fall under probabilistic complete algorithms uh, here are the references uh, with that we come to the end of uh, the first lecture uh, which is the basics of uh, motion planning uh, in further lectures we will be discussing uh, the two types that we uh, talked about the approximation and the randomization and the various algorithms so we will first be discussing uh, the grid based algorithm uh, including uh, Dijkstra, A star etc and then we will be talking about RRT and probabilistic roadmaps thank you